route she traveled. Honoring women who made a difference. A Cooler Kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview with Janet Cush, conducted on April 28th by Melanie. What do you really do? Um, right now, what I am, I'm the director of Options Clinic, which is a clinic in town that provides health care to women. Um, women ages 13, and some of our patients are as old as 77. Why do you do this? That's kind of a long story. <laughs> well, it all started, I think, when um, I was in eighth grade, and I uh, started menstruating, and my mom said to me, you can have a baby. And I had no idea how that happened. And I thought, oh my goodness, I don't want young people to be as dumb as I am. And there were also some girls that were in school at the time that had gotten pregnant as teenagers. And I thought, that shouldn't happen to teenagers. Um, I thought about that baby that had a mom that was really young, and I thought about that mom who lost her childhood. So that's when it started, and so I thought, well, I think it's important to have more information about sexuality because I believe in children and I advocate for children. And I really believe that children should come into families where they'll be loved and cared for. So when I was a sophomore, I thought, well, maybe I'll get some more information about sexuality. So I was in my biology class and we never got to the part about human sexuality. We just got as far as the pigs. And I went on to college, and I became a registered nurse. And in my college education, um, I um, had an anatomy and physiology class, and we finally got to human biology, but it was also the last page in the book. But I still didn't think I had good answers about learning about human sexuality. So I was about 32, and I had been married 10 years, and I had three kids, and I took a course at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. I was working on a major in community health education. And I finally had a course that, that taught me about sexuality. After that, I um, taught nursing students at Viterbo University for a while. And then I had an opportunity to work at Teen Health Services. Um, that was a program that was at Gunderson Lutheran, and the goal of that program was to be advocates for teenagers and adolescents. Um, that program had a part, um, I worked with pregnant and parenting teens, as did a dietitian and a social worker. I would work with pregnant teens that um, so that they had good information about normal pregnancy. Um, I taught Lamaze classes so that they would understand um, what it would be like and how they could have a healthy birthing process. Part of what I did too was go out and talk in schools. And I talked about all kinds of issues. I, I talked about healthy eating, I talked about positive relationships, I talked about teen suicide, I talked about contraception, I talked about sexually transmitted diseases, um, all working to make sure that young people had good information so they could be safe and make good decisions. Another part of what I did too was I worked with teens, I would come into the schools or I would work with teens and their parents. Um, kids that are struggling at home, parents that were struggling with their teenage kids. And uh, we'd try and figure out, well, was this just some of the normal stuff that goes on with teenagers, or is this something that they need some extra help with? I um, worked in that part of the program probably about three, four, maybe five years, and I realized that so many of the young people that I were seeing had very difficult lives at home, stuff that they struggled with. Um, lots of times young women, young men had been sexually abused, had been sexually assaulted, they had parents that were um, emotionally or mentally ill. And one of the things I also 
became, it just reinforced that um, idea that, wow, it's really important for kids to come into families when their mom and dad are, are ready or when their parents are ready to make them a priority. So then I started working in teen pregnancy prevention. So we wrote a grant and um, got some money. We did a survey. We surveyed uh, the schools in La Crosse County and the goal of the survey was to find out what kids knew about sexuality, what they wanted to know, and who they wanted to hear it from. Um, what they did know is people knew lots about biology. What they wanted to know more about was how to have positive relationships. Who they wanted to hear it from, um, they felt school was a good place to learn about sexuality from health teachers, um, from counselors, and that was a good that was a good place, but the number two place they wanted to hear from was from their parents, their kids about sexuality because they were uncomfortable, they didn't know how, um, they didn't have good information. Um, so I worked with a group of people, and one of the people I worked with actually while I was at Teen Health Service was the uh, Sue Mormon, who was a community educator from Options Clinic. And we worked on a book that was for parents, so that parents had good information to talk to their kids about sexuality. I worked at that for a while, and that was funded by money from the state government, and the money from the state government stopped. Um, so it was a wonderful program. I loved it. I loved working with adolescents. They kept me young. They kept me smart. <laughs> they kept me fresh and understanding what was going on in the world. Um, but the funding stopped and the, the job at Options opened up. Um, and so I applied for it and I, I got that position because I felt this is really an opportunity to um, help uh, families make decisions about when they have kids so that they have kids um, when they can make them a priority. I, I remember a young woman, because we would go to the detention center and we would do some educational presentations at the detention center and there. And one of the presentations that I talked about is, you know, when are you ready to be a parent? And some of the kids would say, well, when you're married, and some would say, when you have a job, uh, when you're in a committed relationship, when you have a house, those kinds of things. And there was a young woman there that said, well, I know people that have that. They've got money, they've got cars, they're married, and they're still really awful parents. And I said to her, I said, well, when do you think somebody's ready to be a parent? And she said, when they're ready to make a child a priority. That's probably the wisest thing I've ever heard. And I've never heard it from anybody else, but from this very wise 17-year-old young woman. So I do what I do now because I think it helps, I believe it helps families decide when they can have a child and when they can bring that child into the world as a priority. I also believe that um, by helping people with contraception and um, it helps women make delay pregnancies, prevent unintended pregnancies, women and families, so that they can realize their career goals, they can be what they want to be and choose to be a mom when they feel that they're ready. How long did it take you to make that book? We started out with, um, there was a CESA in northern Wisconsin that had worked with a community group, um, and they had put it together. So our first book was a um, just a regular notebook paper stapled in the corner, and we made it available free to parents. And we found that parents really liked it. So um, we worked on it again, and we, we looked at what was there. There were a group of people that worked, uh, a fellow by the name of Lance Elman from uh, CESA and Sue Mormon from Options Clinic. I worked on it. And then I think there were some other folks that worked on it to, to put it together, and we got it in a nice format so it was easy to use, and it was sturdier than an eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper stapled in the corner. 
So we got it funded by the Children's Miracle Network and Gunderson Lutheran. Um, they did the formatting for it and we got it printed. And each, um, that was probably in about 1992, 1993. It's been reprinted five times since then. Um, it's latest, the latest way that it looks is because um, board members on the Options Clinic board, um, one of them works for Crescent Printing, and she got it printed for us. Um, she got a, a really good deal on the cost of printing. So it's in color, and it's, um, and the way that it looks is a result of another one of our board members who does design. Um, she runs a company called Creative Edge, and so she made it look really nice and, and easy to read. It now has been translated into Russian. We had some folks that visited us. They were interested in reproductive health care, and so our nurse practitioners and their nurse practitioners and doctors met, and they um, found out about our book and had listened to our nurse practitioners and community educators and decided that parents in Russia would like the same thing. So World Services had it translated into Russian. They've printed 2,000 copies. It's up on a health website and um, it can be accessed through Eastern Europe and Asia. So my goal to make sure that kids have good information is awesome. And the best part is to its parents talking to kids. When you about work, you work with lots of people, and you work in the smaller happen. groups. Um, Options Clinic has 26 employees. I'm one of those 26, um, and so. I work with my staff, sometimes in small groups, which may be five or six. Um, and I also work with my staff as a whole, sometimes, so that's 26. Um, and it comes down to what, what is my work and what do I do? Um, I spend time advocating for um, the opportunity that, that all women, whether they're rich or poor, have access to reproductive health care. So when I'm doing that, sometimes I'm working with legislators and explaining to them how some of the, the bills and some of the laws that they're making, how that will affect women um, and having access to, to contraception. Um, Sometimes I'm talking in front of larger groups, um, talking about how important it is to have access to contraception. So I work with people one-on-one -on -one in small groups and in large groups. I do, I do all of that. Now, I noticed you brought in some awards. Could you tell us a little bit about those? Um, one of the awards that I got that I'm really proud of, I got from the Children's Museum, and that was um, as a child advocate. And I, re I do what I do because I really believe that the healthiest way for kids to come into the world is to have their family ready to make them a priority. So that, that's pretty special. An award that I didn't bring that I'm getting on May 3rd, it's from the um, Community Action Program. And that's an award, it's a state award for being an outstanding advocate. So that's fun. The term, the road she traveled, what does that mean to you? The road I've traveled, what does that mean to me? I guess when I think about that, I, I think about it's, it's the journey I've taken. And it's interesting because I, I think probably when I was 12, 14, 15, 16 years old and I saw what was happening to me, I didn't have good information. I saw people my own age being teen moms. Um, at that point in time, I thought, you know, this shouldn't be happening. So I think my destiny was determined at that point in time. However, it took me a long time to get there because that was probably, well, I was 12 to 14, 
12 to 16 years old, and I think I started working at Teen Health when I was, oh, let me think. I was probably, I started in 87. I was about 42 years old. So I think it took me that long to, to reach my destiny. And that, um, and that allowed me to begin to explore and to actually work on the things that I really thought were important. How do you do your job? Wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> How do I do my job? Um, I think I do my job in lots of ways. Um, I think I do my job with working with my staff and um, setting goals and planning and creating the future that we want for our organization. So I do that working with my staff. Um, I talk to people in the community, the public health officers. I talk to people that I know that support the, the work and the care that Options and Reproductive uh, Options Clinic does. Um, so that's a big part of what I do is planning and working with lots of different people, creating a, a plan that'll be best for the patients that we care for, the clients that we care for. Um, part of how I do my work is talking with other people about the work that we do, helping them understand um, what we do. Um, there are folks that don't have good information about the care that we provide, and so it's important for me to help people understand exactly what it is we do, um, particularly all the health care that we provide. Um, we see 6,300 uh, clients that's unduplicated, that's just counting them once in about 18,000 visits on an annual basis. We provide a lot of health care. The health care we provide is to predominantly um, women that have few resources, so our services are available um, whether you have money or you don't have money. Um, no one's turned away because they don't have money. Um, so we are really working um, on prevention. And that's another piece. I think that's a thread. Um, when you talk about the journey I've traveled, I think it's not only children, but it's what can we do to prevent hard things happening for people. I'm more interested in preventing them than trying to fix them. So uh, talking to people, I do a lot of my work planning, um, talking to people, advocating for the, for the work that we do, and then a lot of what I do is raising money. Um, I spend a lot of my time doing that, working with my staff. We write grants. Um, right now we're um, updating our clinic because it's 15 years old and it's not looking it's starting to look kind of shabby so I'm meeting with people to um, raise money so that we can um, renovate it and have it look better so sometimes I think my main job is get money so that we can continue to provide services because 63 percent of the people that we see are at or below a hundred percent of poverty and they don't pay anything for their services so we've got to figure out how do we get continue to get services um, to men and women, because we see men too, about 9% of the people that we see are men, is figuring out how do we have enough money um, so that we can care for people. Do you have any goals for the future? The goals that I would have for the future would be that we would have the resources to make our services available to anyone who would want them. Um, right now, um, it's, some t it's a struggle just to have the money to pay for the people that we currently see. That's an ongoing struggle, but my dream would be that um, anyone that wanted access to reproductive health services, to contraception, to birth control, would have that access. Does your family pay a 
play a big role in what you do? I th I think that the role that my family pay played played in that was um, I knew that as I was growing up that my brother and I were just really important. Um, I think that we were always well taken care of and knew that we were a priority in, in my family. Uh, I think that's probably the, the biggest influence it's had. I think my husband has had a lot of influence in terms of um, talking about and telling me uh, you can do whatever you want to do. You just figure out a way to do it. Um, you can reach your goals, you can reach your, your dreams. And I think my, I have three children. Um, Charlie's 35, Ben is 32, and Anne is 30. And um, I learn from them all the time. Um, they uh, are a big influence on my life too because they set me straight when I might be a, off the beam a little bit. And, and they're very wise. Um, they're much wiser than I was at that age. Do you have any like role models or people who really support you in what you're doing? Um, the people that really support me, my parents, uh, really support me in what I'm doing. Uh, my husband is incredibly supportive of me and what I'm doing. My kids, uh, my three kids, are incredibly supportive. Um, I look at the board of directors that I have. Uh, they're people that volunteer their time to oversee uh, the work that we do. Um, they're incredibly supportive. Um, my staff is very supportive of what I do as well. Heroes, role models, um, I can think of somebody, a couple of people that, that stand out in my mind. Um, one of them is, is Dick Swant. You may or may not know that name. He was superintendent here for 25 years. Um, but whenever he made decisions, what happens in the school, he, the decisions he made and the questions he always asked is, what is best for kids? And sometimes people weren't willing to do what was best for kids and he would stand on that and he went through some really hard times um, because there were people in the public that just didn't um, listen to him and they wanted to kick him out of office but he stood his ground and he got the support of teachers and so yeah he's he's certainly somebody that locally that I think is a is a hero I think that there are uh, women who have stood up for children um, I'm trying to think the the woman who's in charge of the Children's Trust Fund nationally, and I can't remember what her name is right now. I mean, she's somebody that um, is constantly advocating for what's best for kids. And I think, again, again, my husband. I think he's a he's a hero too because he's always has just a really positive can do. I can think of one more person, uh, Barbara Lawton, who is our lieutenant governor. She is an amazing woman. Um, she really stands up for what she believes in. She particularly stands up for uh, women, women's health, um, women's uh, making sure that there are opportunities for women to be all that they can be and reach their potential. Is there a certain title that you're called? Yes, my title is executive director. Is that the like? Have you worked up from that at the options clinic, or did you start? Like, where did you start when you first started? I started as the executive director, and I. How long do you plan on working for? Um. Actually, I'm going to be 60 this year, and I'm thinking about retirement. So I'm looking at retiring probably in the next three to five years. What do you plan to do when you retire? Like, do you still plan to be involved with um, kind of what you're doing? I would very much like to continue to, to volunteer. I think in terms of what it would be um, that I would do was I would be more involved on the legislative side in terms of um, 
being active in making sure that legislators understand the impact of some of the laws and legislation and how that will affect women's families' lives. If there was like a message that you, is there like a message that you really want to get out to kids about teenage pregnancies or women health health care or what you're doing? Something that you just really want people to know. I, I think when I th when I think of of teens, I think of um, learn to respect yourself and believe in yourself. Um, listen to what your gut says. Um, have good conversations with your parents. Um, let them know um, that you're interested in listening to what they have to say and ask them to make sure that they listen to what you have to say. Um, I would say to parents, um, this might make me cry, <laughs> love your children, care for them, make them a priority in your life. I guess the, the thing that I found when I worked at Teen Health was so many kids were dealing with such tough stuff in their lives. So have children when you're ready to make them a priority and love them, love them, love them. Uh, the other thing I'd say to kids, be safe and make good decisions. <laughs> um, and as far as um, women's health, I think the message would be um, as we look at health care, there really needs to be a basic level of health care that's available to all people. And that means things like um, immunizations, well baby visits, um, care for women and families when they're pregnant, um, and access to all that preventative care that, that helps people. Broad access to reproductive health services. This podcast brought to you from La Crosse, Wisconsin by the Cooley Kids at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.